Hello everyone, today I'm going to do episode number one of Bare and Basic. All the science stuff without the filming fluff. This is partly because of Elias Timmons on YouTube saying that I'd rather see you do something for two hours without all the fancy music and stuff. So I'm going to try something a little different, which is to go through different scenarios on a different uh, thing to try to teach you comprehensive understanding. So that way, instead of getting lost in data sheets and uh, YouTube searches and Google searches on the information you want, you'll be able to look for the information you actually want and be able to get somewhere instead. Uh, today we're going to be covering the zero voltage switching power supply. It's a simple power supply, it only really requires three parts, uh, two diodes, two MOSFETs, and two resistors. I say three parts because it's less confusing than remembering six. Uh, so I've got a whole bunch of MOSFETs in here, different types, surface mount MOSFETs, uh, through hole MOSFETs, uh, got my diodes, and got a whole bunch of 470 ohm resistors. Part of this is also due to Ardlan. Ardlan is someone who we met through Join the Technicians, Jeremiah and I, uh, mostly Jeremiah, who runs the channel Join the Technicians. Uh, we've been trying to teach Ardlan how to build one of these ZBS power supplies, and he has been having issues. Hopefully this will answer a lot of your questions, Ardalan, because we really want to see you succeed. Uh, there's been a lot of questions you've asked, and I'm sure a lot of people have these questions. This is going to be a little bit of a different video. As I said, it's not a tutorial, but a real-life working scenario. Different situations, different parts, different problems, different successes. Uh, it's going to be pretty raw. I'm going to do some video cutting. Uh, not a lot of video cutting because, let's face it, I'm going to say a lot of things, going to try to explain a lot of things, going to be very vocal in this video. I say it because I know you can understand it. You can. You can understand it. What Bare and Basic is about, confronting problems as they come. Because every technician and engineer has problems. We confront them. We overcome them, obviously. Uh, don't worry about not understanding any of this stuff, too. Two things to remember. First thing. Everybody starts off on the same level. Everybody starts off not knowing anything about this. We kind of, you know, plop out of the womb without any kind of programming about stuff. Number two, uh, humans built this, not aliens. So it's not like we're decoding anything that humans can't understand. And last time I checked, a majority of my YouTube subscribers were indeed human. If not, please let me know. I would love to meet some aliens. I think it'd be fun. Uh, I probably will understand your technology and get along just fine with you. Let's get to building, and uh, let's get to troubleshooting. There's lots of things going on here. We're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, try to pay attention to some of the things that I say as well. As I said, I'm going to say a lot of things. They're all going to be important. I'm going to try not to waste your time, but I'm also going to say what's on my mind, too. Because, well, I have an active imagination. An active mouth. The mouth parts move. Everybody's like, yeah, you have one mouth and two ears. I'm just like, no, I have one ear now. This ear doesn't work anymore. I have two lips, I have one tongue. That's three against one right now. It's math. Looking at this, this is a basic ZBS circuit that's wired up. So there's a couple of things that are going on here. I'll flip it around so you can kind of see the other side as well. Uh, this is a very simple circuit. It has six parts, two MOSFETs, two resistors, and two diodes. So we have uh, the MOSFETs right here. So there's one, and there's one. Now you may have heard of uh, different types of MOSFETs and channel, P-channel, uh, depletion mode and enhanced mode MOSFETs. Uh, these we're not going to worry about as far as looking up what they are. Not at this point. But it doesn't matter. These are diodes. Now these are important. You cannot use uh, things like Zener diodes or gun diodes or trigger diodes. You must use either signal diodes or Scotty does. And uh, here are two resistors. They are 470 ohms and they're connected up to the positive. So take a good look at this. You'll also notice that uh, I have some wires. So if you see that the gates of the MOSFETs, each one of the gates, so this right here is connected to both one of the resistors and one of the diodes on the other MOSFET gate. On a MOSFET, the center pin. On most MOSFETs is your... Uh, your uh, blah, blah, blah. On the center pin and on this tab right here, 
is normally your drain and this side of the MOSFET right here is what's known as your source which is where the power goes in so this is your negative since you're probably going to be using n-channel MOSFETs so negative wire goes to the source of each MOSFET the drain of each MOSFET you connect a diode now you have to connect it with the cathode connected to the drain because when these turn on what's going to happen is is a negative electrical current is going to go from the source through the MOSFET into the drain and it's going to come out of the drain it's going to go through this diode and when it goes through this diode it's going to turn off this MOSFET we got these two resistors here that are also connected to the gates and what they do is they turn on the MOSFETs so you need to supply a positive bias initially for startup to each MOSFET this circuit works because one MOSFET is likely to turn on before the other and the MOSFET that turns on the first is the one that stays on the first uh, and from there oscillation will begin so how do we test this and see if it's working before we put a load on the MOSFETs uh, I tend to test it with a pair of LEDs by that I mean I have taken here a set of blue LEDs and I'll show you how I wired them up so on here like you would drive your transformer this would be your positive so I've got both of the LED uh, anodes connected to one another which would be your center tap on your primary and I've got the two cathodes which is the negative like you would drive the other two coils or the same uh, outside coils of your center tap primary on your transformer I'll explain more about that if you don't know exactly what I mean about transformer configurations in a little bit or later on in the video. So, to test the CBS with low voltage and low current, it's very simple. You just connect up the LED where you would connect the center tap between the two on the two anodes. So, this is your positive wire. This wire will be coming off the battery positive. It's also connected to the two resistors. And then I have two gray wires on the MOSFETs. And these are connected to the drains of the MOSFETs. And each one of these will go on to one of the cathodes of the LEDs. So one to one, one to the other. A lot of solder on there. Okay. So now that those LEDs are connected, I'm going to take the negative of the battery and I'm going to connect it on the negative. And when I connect it up to uh, the positive wire right here, one LED should come on. Right there. So, right now, everything is working as it should. So, to test it, as you see, I have another negative lead coming off that negative wire. And to test your ZBS, you're going to take your negative wire and you're going to touch it to the other side of the LED that isn't lit and you'll see that it will trigger the LED back and forth so whole circuit now just like that and this is a good way to test your circuit to see if your circuit is running the way you want it to and this will almost work on any kind of ZBS uh, just for diagnostics so this circuit seems to be working just as it is 
Once again, I'm gonna show you how that circuit's configured. Show you how that circuit's configured. So take a good look at that. And uh, this is where I've got the LEDs connected to. And then there's a positive, and then my negative. So let's hook up a transformer. Now we got this little test dummy neon light here. Focus. Here we go. Got this little neon light here. And uh, I've got this little rewound transformer that we can use for testing. I'm going to go ahead and uh, unsolder that. So this is just a test run to see if this is working. So what I'm going to do is between uh, the positive and negative. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> okay. So first thing that helps is having a capacitor. Uh, I recommend using a capacitor that is actually about four times higher than the voltage you're going to be putting in. So if you're putting in uh, 10 volts, I would recommend like a 40 volt capacitor, if not more. Uh, a system that oscillates will increase voltage. No. So, I am going to put this capacitor between our two external leads of the primary which will be our two negatives. And then I am going to put an inductor right here. Uh, so I'm going to choose my inductor based on kind of what I want. And this can take a couple of tests. Sometimes using a good inductor just is difficult. Uh, so I'm going to take this inductor. It's a pretty low value inductor. Probably not ideal, but I can handle the current. Okay. I got that little guy in there, which is on the uh, center tap. And then I'm going to connect up this to a ZBS driver. Simple. So I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this. Connect it out here. Like that, and then uh, connect this one right here to that. Same thing. So you kind of see how that's configured now. I've got the uh, capacitor in between the two outside legs, and then where I got that center tap, I've got my positive. So let's see if this drives the fluorescent light bulb. wires to that. Okay, so here's what I've got running now. Got this in the end light connected to our little sloppy ZBS circuit there. And I uh, got a little high voltage transformer here. Yeah, yeah, looks good. Okay, well, let's power it up, see if it works. Should, right? No output. And nothing. Look at that. 
Nothing at all. Okay, so what's going on, man? No sparks, no nothing. Let's try another battery. Oh, look at that. There's a battery. Okay, so, as you can see, the CBS is working pretty well. Cool. Oh, those MOSFETs are pretty cool, too. Alright, well. <clears throat> Let's run this a little bit and see what happens. See if those MOSFETs get warm or not. See what gets warm. Check the temperature on this MOSFETs. Wow! Nothing is warm. <clears throat> well, huh? I uh, I kind of expected something to not work as well as it is appearing to work. Let's figure out how well it's really working. We're gonna leave this uh, just run for a while, I guess. I need a battery uh, holder. Dun, 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 dun. Here we go. So I got a battery holder here. About it. Okay, Let's see if there's a uh, battery voltage in there, yes. Oh yeah, plenty. I'm gonna raise this up. Okay, so it's kind of hard to screw up when you've been doing things a long time. So, I have built a rather rudimentary ZBS. Uh, I'm going to see if this has a fail anywhere in it by just letting it run. <laughs> that seems to be the easiest way of testing. So, I'm going to tap on that. Piece of solder for a fuse. So, okay. Yeah, uh, the MOSFET short out. It should uh, take that fuse of solder out long before anything happens. So, oh yeah. Fuck. Well, shit, that worked. <laughs> God, those are really good MOSFETs. Wow, these are barely warm. Let's see what the transformer feels like. Transformer's cool. Well, apparently that's how you build a CBS. It was easier than I had expected. I don't know how to feel about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Look at that little one. I want to really drive this into a fail state, man.
to kind of arc and get off the transformer, man. Not too much. Yeah, we're not really driving that. God, the tube is like the warmest thing. The tube is the warmest thing. Yeah, that's totally fine. Well, try Baker Transformer. Okay, so moving on to bigger and hopefully better things. We have here a common large TV flyback transformer from a CRT. I have a nice battery bank. We have a wound primary now with a center tap. We have a bigger uh, capacitor, a bigger inductor, same ZBS circuit. So, can we get this transformer with this light bulb? Let's uh, find out. Oh, not much of anything. Terrible. Maybe we need more voltage. That could be it. Let's put more voltage in. Uh, is this here? Nothing. <laughs> so, let's see, let's connect it. Let's connect it. Let's uh, bypass the inductor, see what happens. Sometimes the inductor can throw things out of tune. Uh, and uh, we can choose a proper inductor later on. So, let's put that together. Let's test out. Oh, without the inductor, we definitely get some light. Okay, so we had a bad inductor in there. Let's go find a, an inductor that works better. Oh, a lot of power. <clears throat> See what we're getting for an arc. A higher voltage.
Uh oh. Okay, well, what just happened now? So everything was working, all of a sudden, the MOSFETs decided that it was going to unsolder itself. So, what happened is that uh, we were just not cooling these MOSFETs. Look at that, this wire fell off, this wire fell off, those MOSFETs were juicing it. Another thing you might notice is that this wire right here is really thick. This is really thick. And all these wires right here coming off the MOSFET are really thin. Uh, you're actually going to use a much bigger wire. And uh, we're going to use cooling. Here's essentially the exact same ZBS setup. Except using... Uh, the Scotty diodes instead of the high speed signal diodes and uh, I can go ahead and run that same LED test so negative and it switches and I'm back so this should be a good working CBS driver all tests indicate that it is I also have it on a heat sink so those are isolated with sill pads so I'll explain more about isolating your gates but let's go ahead and connect this ZBS drive up, see how it handles. So, right here on the inductor. For the uh, shirt positive. Now there is kickback from the inductor and from the transformer. Uh, so it's best to use Zener diodes across the ground and the gate, which I have not done to protect your MOSFET gates. But I have copious loads of MOSFETs, so if I blow one up right now, I don't really care. Alright, <clears throat> now we can test the uh, output of this, again at uh, lower voltages, I'm going to take the uh, neon light again, connect it up, there's so much stuff on my desk, and uh, we'll see how it runs at lower operational voltages, but you can see it does. Cool, alright, so... Let's connect it up. Run it with higher operational voltages. Uh, to the ZBS, see what kind of arc we can get off this little bugger. Uh, <laughs> so like right now I'm floating. That's an electrical term. Alright, so, that's 3 volts, uh, it's, uh, sorry, uh, 4.2 volts, it sounds like a camera charging, come on, line up, behave, not much, okay, let's try, that one. Oh yeah, it's starting to get a little angry. Okay, this voltage. Yeah, these things are terrible. Hmm. So I have made repairs to this ZBS, and I have it running now on 12 volts. We have a, a little inductor, two capacitors, 
uh, this little transformer, which is now uh, not as good as it was when the sides broke off. And uh, we've got it shoddily connected to this uh, fluorescent light bulb here. So, if I hook it up, let's say 4.2 volts, not much really anything. Uh, moving over to uh, 8.4 volts, you can see it lights up. So that's pretty good. And then moving on to 12 volts, even brighter. Oh, actually, it seems to run about the same. So let, let's run it on the 8.4 volts. Uh, I've got something here to show you as well. So right here. Let's see if I can focus it on it. Alright, so right here I have a mini ZBS made of little MOSFETs. I've got the two uh, little MOSFETs on the bottom. So let's find out what I have here. So these are two 24 volt, two amp end channel MOSFETs that are surface mount. I've got the two surface mount diodes in the configuration, so if you can kind of see there. Uh, you got the line side here, and you got the line side here, so cathode, and cathode, and in the center, anode, and anode. And I've got my two 330 resistors, 330 ohm resistors, okay. Much better. I'm going to sit there let you take a look at this for a little while. I'm going to rotate it in my hand. You can kind of see what the bottom looks like as well. So it's the exact same wiring configuration. So, got on this side uh, the two sources. The white wire is the gates. And this black wire coming out here, connected to the cathodes of the LEDs, is the uh, drains. And then this is the positive. It's also connected to the two resistors here. And then to where the battery connects. So, go ahead and test this as we would with the other uh, ZBS drives for the battery. And uh, we're doing the LED test again. Is uh, also, before we do that, uh, the individual parts that are in this ZBS, you don't necessarily need all the wires. I'm going to show you that. So, right here. Are these same little parts? So, got my two SMT MOSFETs, my two SMT diodes, and then my two SMT resistors. So, it's the same six parts as any other ZBS really consists of. Now, we'll put these down and wire up this transformer. Refocus. Now, we'll wire up this transformer after testing. To uh, this little ZBS power supply, and I expect it to run for about half a second before turning into smoke, at best. So let's see if that's what happened. So as I said, these things are rated for 2 amps and 24 volts. Now they have a power dissipation of 2 watts, uh, which isn't much. In fact, 2 watts in this situation isn't uh, anywhere near adequate. It's a 40 watt light bulb. If you take a look at the math, 24 volts and 2 amps, you might think that these things can do uh, nearly 40 watts. It should be enough for this. But these little MOSFETs can't do 40 watts. They have no chance of doing 40 watts. They're not properly cooled enough to do 40 watts. But we're going to see what happens anyway which I suspect will be a proof. So we know this configuration runs off 8.4 volts uh, really well and uh, we know that 8.4 volts is not exceeding the MOSFET gate uh, nor the source so in reality the numbers just might work. But, they will not work for very long. <laughs> uh, this is the fun part of science. Alright. Oh, I didn't even show you that it worked, huh? My dumbass. Okay, well, I'm going to hook up the LEDs back to that. i show you that this is actually a fun functioning uh, MOSFET. Uh, blue. Then.
Alright. Uh, not too sure that our ZBS drive will theoretically work. I'm going to connect the negative and the positive. And uh, we have one LED that lights up, so, so far so so. Uh, and then I'm going to touch the other side of the LED and it should swap to that one. Which it does. So, technically, this CBS should work. That's, I'm excited. Let's, let's find out. I'm going to connect it up to the uh, transformer and capacitor and inductor here. So first things first, we're going to put the inductor right here uh, into the positive. Just like that. We've got these uh, capacitors that need to be soldered on. I will quit coming apart you. Now I assure you, you want to do uh, better soldering uh, than I'm doing. I said this is just for demos. Take your time. If you're going to do something, do it right. But for demonstration purposes, uh, this should work just fine. It's not like it needs to run for more than half a second. If my power dissipation calculations are right, that's about how long it is going to run. We'll, we'll find out. Come here, you. Whatever. Okay, well that's everything. Kind of, sort of, connected. So, uh, let's put 8.4 volts into it, see what happens. Now, I said, technically the numbers do work out. They're not going to be overcurrenting or overvolting the gate. <laughs> but what simply is going to happen is that the, bait, the uh, MOSFET is going to get so hot that uh, it's just going to kind of melt like a muffin in the rain. So here's our circuit. Uh, we're gonna see how long it actually runs in real life. Uh, place your bets, folks. Will it last for more than half a second? Let's find out if it even lasts that long. Well, oh, hey, you saw that. I didn't see any smoke, so I'm betting it's still good. Wow. Look at those little tiny MOSFETs juicing. Oh, there goes the smoke. Let's see how long it runs. Let's see what's failing. Ooh, that's the transformer primary. Wow! That is impressive. Those MOSFETs aren't even warm. Well, they're warm, but... Wow! No way! Okay, that was completely unexpected. These MOSFETs performed extremely well. Holy hell. Look at that. Holy shit. Wow, they were cooler than the bigger ones. Whew. I smoked that primary. Okay, wow. So we got a failure point. It's an unexpected failure point. Uh, I thought the little MOSFETs were just going to blow up. Uh, that didn't happen. Actually... The MOSFETs worked really well. Let me show you what did happen. Focus. Okay, now you can kind of see on the transformer, uh, there is a discolorization. Uh, it used to be red wire, uh, the coating actually burned off. As you can see, it's no longer a red color in the center. It's more of a kind of a bronze copper color in the center yeah wow good job little MOSFETs holy shit 
I did not expect that. I'm going to rewrap this transformer. Now, that was totally unexpected. These MOSFETs are a boss. Look at that. So I guess don't let size fool you. These things can actually perform. That was at 8.4 volts. They didn't seem to care. Wonderful. Make sure to uh, still try to dissipate heat, but that was incredible. If you can see here, I built this little ZVS because I saw those little MOSFETs work so well. Now this thing is tiny. In fact, in comparison, here's like a laser diode, 5.6 millimeters. Uh, the, the ZVS driver is literally smaller than the laser diode itself. Look at that. It's ridiculous. I have also rewound the transformer primary since I burned it up at the last one. So that should be seven and seven turns. The Litz wire is a little thinner, so it should be a little less heavy on the current, but should work. But first, let's test out the mini driver. Uh, so. Firstly, uh, negative to negative, LEDs hooked up and positive, one LED should come on, uh, which it does on this little driver. And then uh, negative to the unlit cathode of the unlit LED, and it changes. So it does the exact same thing that uh, all the other functioning drivers have done. But, can such a small ZBS driver light up this big light bulb? Well, I'm really curious to find this out now. This will be by far the smallest CBS that I have put together. Let's see if I can, uh, maybe I have another one that I can show you. Some of my other small ones that didn't quite work as well as I would have hoped. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll maybe show you some of those in the video. But yeah, there's a couple of them. So let me check in here, maybe there's one in here. Ah uh, yes, okay, so. Uh, this right here is one of the smallest ZBS drivers I put together initially beforehand. Uh, not the smallest one. But, uh, there's definitely a size difference between those two. I gotta, I, just, I gotta find this out. Uh, alright, well. No time like the present, right? So, uh, if uh, that transformer is wired correctly, uh, which it probably is, uh, this should just light up, no problem. My only reservations are uh, I've used smaller diodes. Uh, they're about one third to uh, one fourth the size of the original diodes that I used in the setup. Uh, the resistors are also smaller, but that really shouldn't matter too much. But uh, I want to show you a size comparison of those diodes uh, between what I was using before and what I'm using now. You can see there's a uh, relative size difference. So, uh, the diodes on the right versus the diodes on the left. Uh, I have no idea what any of these diodes are, really, so I'm just kind of blindly guessing at this point. But, I've had pretty good luck with swapping diodes out. Um, it's probably going to be a little bit more of a sensitive diode, but whatever. Uh, it'll probably work just fine. My biggest concern is that the transformer primary is not going to be in resonance, and uh, it's going to draw a lot of current at this point. And maybe uh, initially blow out those MOSFETs. I'm hoping this isn't the case. Alright, so let me show you what I've got set up. I've got a little piece of solder running from that light bulb down to here, which is connected to the transformer output, and this white wire is kind of hanging off there. Now that little transformer here. Got negative wire that's black, the red wire which is my positive, got my battery bank here, connected up to positive, little transformer, and of course, right here, the ridiculously small CBS driver, which may and or may not work. So. I'm going to go ahead and tilt that down. good I think we're okay to test nothing seems shorted 
Uh, everything seems in the clear. I'm gonna turn off this light here. All right, and I'm gonna quick touch it, see if it lights up. Oh, that's fantastic. Let's try uh, 4.2 volts. Not quite as bright. I need some capacitors. Yeah, that's great. That's running off a single battery. All right, so I got this high voltage transformer. Uh, here's my primary that uh, I've already cut here in the bottom. Uh, it's already wired up for about 40 volts input on here, and it's uh, a full bridge configuration. So we've got something that's wired up similar to uh, this little guy right here. Uh, this is another full bridge configuration. Uh, two wires and then a coupling capacitor right here. Uh, so you only need two wires to run this type of configuration, which I'll show you. Uh, works really easy, but it's not ZBS. So we gotta rewind this for not only the ZBS style, which is a center tap, but we're also gonna run a higher current at a lower voltage. And there's plenty of wire to make our own litz wire for that. This is already a thinner gauge of litz wire. And we're gonna use this wire to make a thicker gauge. I'm just gonna take all this wire off the transformer try to keep it pretty nice probably going to be several feet probably about 30 foot of wire on here uh, it's nice because it's actually all plastic guarded so I don't really have to worry about the ferrite scraping up the wire it looks like a pretty good wire too pretty good quality wire this usually takes forever Now I gotta find the center of this wire that I just pulled off and pulled it over I think four times. Uh, four times the thickness of this. We gotta, gotta make sure the whole wire's straightened out. There's no kinks in it. That looks pretty good. Yeah, looks really good. So let's do that. I'll be right back after I do that. But essentially. It's just folding the wire back and forth four times on itself so I'll be doing basically this and then I'm gonna be wrapping up the whole thing so you'll see what that looks like when I'm done with the whole strand of wire here okay with center found in uh, the new uh, four twisted wire so I got two areas here my two ends gonna find center real quick Gonna twist up center, that'll be our center tap. And uh, I'm gonna be starting at the middle of the transformer, so here. And I'm gonna be taking my horrible wires and I'm just gonna be twisting them in. So, uh, I didn't get as much wire as I thought I was gonna do out of this, so it's gonna be interesting to see exactly how many turns I'm left over uh, with. Uh, once this is on, I have no idea. I'll be lucky if I make six. So it's definitely going to be a low voltage, high current coil that I'm putting on. Figure maybe 10 volts uh, at something like 20 amps. Uh, well, not 20. It's maybe not a 200 watt core, but 10 volts at uh, 8 amps. If you do 10 volts at 8 amps, 80 watts out of this, no problem. Depending on the duty cycle. So how many can we get on there? On the upside, at least we know all the wire will fit. Not a kink there. Going off camera, bad Patrick. Oh, 
I'm going to go start over on the other side now. Did we get? Alright, now they're going to be going in opposite ways. So, as you can see, uh, this side is coming up now on this side. And regardless of if your coils lay on top of one another, uh, or if they go side by side like what I'm doing here, their coils will always go uh, in opposite ways. So one's going to be a right hand coil, one's going to be a left hand coil from center. Oh, I don't like that little wire sticking up there. Get in there. Now you're going to want to wrap the same amount of coils per side. So for example, 6 and 6, 10 and 10, 4 and 4, whatever. Uh, it's dependent on how much current and how much voltage you want to put in. So as I said, this is a now low voltage, high current coil. Whereas uh, it might have used to operate at, say, 40 volts. I can bring that ratio down by 10. Of course, this brings up the ratio of current, or not ratio by 10, uh, ratio by 4. So, if this was, uh, say, pushing 40 watts of power, instead of it being 40 watts at 10, or sorry, 40 watts at 1 amp at uh, 40 volts, now it would be 10 volts at 4 amps. So what do we got here now? It's counter coils. One, two, three, four, center. One, two, three, four. Five. Let's do five on that side again. One more on this side, which will give us a six and six. I'd like to see if we can get maybe seven and seven on. I think we just might be able to. I don't like all that loose wire. I pull it more taut, but whatever. This is a rough coil, demonstration purposes only. All right. That uh, should be just about it. So that should give us our six and our six. So maybe four, seven, and seven. Let's see what happens. getting quite hard to put in there now.
Yeah, we can do seven and seven. All right, so this should be a good transformer then. So from this point, I'm just gonna wrap these, make sure they're uh, decently tight. It's a really sloppy transformer windings. Whatever. Uh, it's 91 degrees and I get the solder. Yay, life is good. So I'm just letting uh, the wire kind of get hot, burn off the enamel coating, and the copper is going to suck in there and continue to wick inside there. Um, you can kind of see now. Look at that. That's beautiful now. I'm going to do these. Looks good. Okay, so uh, I have rewound this transformer, this is a bigger one, and have an inductor and capacitor in there. And uh, what I have is I've taken the liberty of rewinding another transformer. Here's what the original transformer looked like. So you can see, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. This is what that original transformer looked like. So you can see the primary wires right here, uh, quite thin. Flip it over, and then there's two terminals, two connections. So now you can run thicker wire, just two connections. So here's one that's driven, so again, with a full H bridge configuration. So turn off the light. So the one with the full H bridge configuration runs pretty well. So I'm gonna move this. Bring it 
bring out the power on that. 16 volts too high. 12 volts. Do 10 volts. And we're gonna turn it on, and you'll see a little arc. Right there. Got to focus. There you go. So right there, a little arc. Not very much of an arc. But you can see it. It's a nice little thing. So, what we're going to do with the ZBS now again. So turning that on. And now we have a ZBS coil that is the one with th the thicker layer. But it has a center tap configuration. But the exact same transformer as you just saw. I was tested out this ZBS driver, so I do know that the driver itself is good. And uh, let's close this gap a little bit. See what we get. Uh, initially, I'll let the uh, transformer also bubble out. Okay, so. Let's test with just one cell worth of power. See what we get. Maybe it'll work, maybe it will not. Not seeming to be much. Maybe two cells. Oh yeah. Right away. So, I'm gonna open that arc a little bit. See if we can rip off that. I'm gonna quickly solder this to my battery holder on the positive so that way we can test out some of the draw oh yeah my solder is underneath there looking for it like where did it go <laughs> okay so let's see what one cell does Let's see if we can get an arc across that. Please don't fall and make a mess. Okay, so we get one cell. Let's see if there's any arc with that one cell. So we can achieve a little bit of arc with one cell. We find the two cells. Now we'll be able to see a little bit more of the output power of this transformer. Hopefully get a little bit better results with it. Uh, once again, the transformer is still submerged in the transformer fluid. This is just uh, arc suppression fluid. It turns out that our atmosphere is rather conductive at certain voltages, so to keep our atmosphere away is a good thing. So let's uh, try with one cell, see what our uh, output is at this point. I also found a bad cell and replaced that, so that'll be better too. Not much there. Go with two cells. Oh yeah, let's go with three full charge cells, see what happens. Oh yeah, that's nice. Let's see if anything's warm. The ZBS drive is really cool at this point. Well, that's good. Let's see. Take, these wires are quite warm. I'll tell you that right now. There's a lot of current coming out of that transformer. For sure. Alright, uh, let's turn off the light. That's what I'm going to do. So now we got that. I'm going to go on to uh, the... Oh, even the screwdriver is warm. Holy shit, that's jacking out the current. Wow, that whole screwdriver tip is, is really hot. Uh, let's see what uh, kind of output power we get. These aren't high drain batteries, so I can't really run this very long uh, without risking batteries doing things I don't want batteries to do. But let's see if we can get a constant arc across here. That is a beautiful arc, though. Oh, 
have to get closer down to it with the camera so you can see the art that I'm drawing off that transformer a little closely. Put the camera in the heat sink. You heat sinks make great little uh great little tripods to move around. I am not even kidding, man. So we can run this transformer to a higher output power too. Turn the light so we can kinda of see where I'm putting it. Yeah, where my wires? Wires. <laughs> wires. Uh -huh. Oh hey. Found them. Cool. Badass. Probably move the phone back here. Yeah, more stable. Okay, cool. Uh, Alright. Uh, now to prop this up. I hope that doesn't fall over. Because that's usually what ends up happening. But that's okay. I guess I can handle whatever comes my way. Alright, so. Got this contacts. Uh, about, let's say, 8 millimeters away. 6 millimeters away from one another. So, that's about 6 millimeters away. 7 millimeters, give or take. So, Pretty decent gap on those wires. So I'm gonna fire it up and uh, let's see the arc jump across. So that's quite an arc on that transformer. Turn off the light. God, that's super nice. Oh, that whole battery pack is warming up too. The ZBS? Still fairly cool. Wow, uh, it looks like that. Actually really stable power supply. So high amperage, I have no idea how much power it's actually putting out. I'm not gonna really test it either, because I don't give a damn. It's not like it's it's not like it's gonna be connected to anything anyway. Uh it's just a demonstration. So, that little ZBS, ZBS, that little ZBS is definitely working uh, for that transformer. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, start building a couple of other ZBSs. ZBSs, I'm sorry, I keep saying ZBS. It's just easier phonetically for me to say, uh, and I'm lazy, and I don't change, change things. I uh, expect things like uh, capacitors to pop up to whatever. <laughs> okay, well, that little ZBS drive looks like it's handling pretty well. Uh, definitely a lot, a lot of current, but that's what I would expect from where on the primary that thick. See, uh, the, even the inductor, the inductor is cool. Everything's pretty cool, except for the wires. <laughs> the wires got hot. Even the, yeah, the screwdriver is still warm. Batteries are still warm. But this and that is cool, and that's good. Okay, so try to get some decently big cores and. Uh, you can see I had a little bit of problem with that. Uh, they were gapped cores, so the cord kind of broke. Not very happy about that. Uh, anyway, got another core right here. It's uh, not as big as I wanted, but uh, it'll do. The transformer. So now I've taken off the ferrite cores, slide into that tube. It's an E core again. Uh, you can kind of see there. That's what I mean by gapped, so when I put the transformer together in the other one, it snapped together and of course there's no center even pressure, so it broke two of the legs off. I'd like to get rid of that gap, but I'm not going to do it immediately, and I may not do it at all, Depend depends on how the transformer works. As I said, a little bit of a smaller transformer, I was hoping to go for a 500 watt transformer. So a little bit bigger of a core, but uh, this probably uh, will do about 300 watts, 250 watts about. Uh, you can see there's a bit of litz wire on here already. 
Of course, this is in the wrong configuration for a step-down transformer. We've got uh, three coils on one side, and now we've got one coil on the other. It's really good litz wire, though, so I'm going to try to save a bunch of that wire so I can use it for other projects. Got a little screw here. Got this. Got our coils. So, let's see what we can get with uh, one of these coils here. Uh, we should get a pretty decent uh, amount of windings. So I'm going to be winding this uh, coil from here to here. See what we can get. Actually, I think I'm going to move this a little forward. So I can make a shorter battery coil. Okay, here's all my wires, that's a lot of wire right there, so now that I've got this, I'm just going to make sure that everything's pretty much in the same area, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to undo that screw right here, and I'm going to bring our cable, we got here all this slits wire, no not lit wire, but uh, electromagnetic wire here. Make sure that things are all pretty much in a same exact uh, length. The better the uh, the same or the the better the better the length matches up, the better uh, your lit wire is going to end up doing. So uh, that matching of length is rather important. Okay, I'm going to find center on these wires. So what I've done is I. I have a tube right here, and uh, that tube kind of makes things a little easier when you're making a uh, litz wire. Bring the camera over here. You'll see why in a second. All right. So now you see the wire I have here. I got this little end kind of sticking out. I take this little end, I wrap it around, kind of it'll help hold things together. And then basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold the tube like this, and I've got a screwdriver right there. I'm just going to use this motion to wrap my wire. See better wraps, I'm not gonna lie. You can tell uh, some of the cables are not the uh, the same length uh, right off the bat, and that's bothering me. So I straighten that out, but give me a couple of pulls and everything here. So now got this wire which will serve as my secondary step down which is a pretty sick wire that's a pretty sick wire okay so now that I got this rebuilt with a 35 plus 35 and a 3 and 3 so roughly a 11 uh, to 1 12 to 1 ratio on the transformer so uh, what I have here is uh, the core the core is not glued together or permanently held together so you'll be able to hear sound that comes out of the transformer. Uh, with any magnetic system in resonance it generates a tone works in a particular frequency and this one happens to be low enough that you can hear. So I want to show you something uh, like with all transformers that when you load the secondary your tone goes down. 
So if the operation your transformer runs at frequency in a self-resonant system drops. So here I'm going to connect the transformer again. You're going to notice that the tone is a little lower now. So this transformer does work. Uh, however, when I try to put higher voltage, it doesn't really seem to do anything. So I'm not really sure why that is. Might be the inductor. Uh, I'm going to build a ZBS that's current. Sorry, a ZBS that's capable of more current. And uh, I want to put this on a higher voltage system. Uh, the secondary definitely can handle uh, 20. 25 volts. Okay, so here I built a significantly bigger ZBS drive. Uh, it's on the larger MOSFETs and larger heatsink. Except I don't have any uh, Zener diodes to put on. So I'm going to have to go down to the shop. Uh, and also larger power supplies too. So, so far the only thing I have is really the 75 amp uh, 30 volt lambda power supply. But uh, I think this can go up to 7580. I think it's rated for 80 amps, hence the big cables. So we're going to see what this can drive once we get some protection on the gates. Uh, that'll be fun. I also got that step down transformer as well, be taken down the shop. So, more stuff. We're going to see if this can just uh, do some big transformer driving, uh, or if she's going to have problems and uh, blow up some parts. So testing is, is on the way. Was not that right? <laughs> that. That sound? Or what? That's like drawing nothing, isn't it? No, it's like going into a second resonance mode because it has no filter. It would certainly be capable of juicing, juicing the beastie current. I know that inside there is a huge fucking cloak. I know the MOSFETs can take it. Let's power up the transformer oven and get this thing baking. It's a transformer. Oh, this, yeah. Yeah, these two, man. These are all horrible. All the flybacks are horrible. Well, okay, yes. The TV flybacks are horrible. But there are some decent things in this box. Well, we start out drawing no power. Good. One get minor. Three volts, five volts. One minor change and a paradigm shift later. Oh, I hear that. That's a lower, uh, lower frequency than it was before. Look at that. Just as predicted. So check this out. Watch the voltage on the power supply drop down to zero. Or not down to zero, but it's going to drop down to the threshold. Right. Five volts? Well, that's because this sucker is six volts. Well, that's because it's clamping at 10 amps. So basically, we know the circuit, the way I designed this in my head, it should draw 30 amps. It should oscillate around 10 kilohertz. Mm-hmm. We need um, more current. Yeah, but I didn't expect the supply to be able to juice it, and it should right. run off a 4S battery. Do we have one of those? Yeah, we do. Do we want to do that? Well, those leads are pretty much jammed right, right in there, so... Like, yeah, I mean, we don't have any other source of power that's capable of actually juicing this. Well, if we want something to possibly go wrong on this CVS, we're going to have to find something to make it possibly go wrong. On it. <laughs> on it. <laughs> <laughs> Those are, what, 75 uh, amp sets? I think so. Now we, uh, if we have made any kind of mistake in our calculations, we'll find it extremely quick. Okay. So it's going to be your job to load the transformer. Oh, right, you mean something to load it with. Okay. You're going to need that, and you're going to need this. You need this. something to hold it with, definitely.
All right. Holy shit, that was gone real <laughs> quick. <laughs> no matter. <laughs> I could run the math and tell you how much current is actually supposed to generate, but uh, I have not even bothered to do that yet. I just Let's get something a little a bit bigger. <laughs> That's great. Let's see if this is spot welding uh, quality. It may or may not be. A little tough to get down in there, yeah. Oh yeah. We should really like put some clamps Ooh. on that transformer. So that way we can clamp it to stuff, you know? Yeah. Is anything even slightly warm? I don't no. think anything is slightly Nothing's warm. Nothing is warm, yeah. Nothing is warm, yeah. Well, that's a good sign. Well, except for this razor blade, it's really <laughs> No shit, I bet it is. Alright, what do you need me to do? you need me to do anything? Nope. Alright. Just, uh, maybe film. Yeah, holy shit. That's back in some ramp right now. Oh, damn. Well, that's on, that's on 3S. There's that. That's, uh, can't wait to get it on for us. That's reduction heating. Alright. No smoke. That's good. Yeah, I'd love to get some clamps on that transformer so we can pop things on there. Jesus Christ. That's, it's not going to have any problem doing spot welding. Nope. No. None whatsoever. So pretty much we're to the point of like jamming it into stuff now, right? Right. Well, so what can we jam it into? Whatever. The blade. Oh. You blew up the moss beds, didn't you? That was catastrophic and not on film. <laughs> that makes me so unhappy. Oh yeah, the MOSFETs exploded. Well, and it wasn't on film. You heard it though. <laughs> oh, you missed it. Yeah. Fried. Let's see in there. Oh. Wow. Yeah, that is toast. Holy shit. <laughs> Man, I wish we could have caught that. Well, you know what we have to do now. These two leads must have touched directly together. <laughs> must have been too much load. <clears throat> Straight from uh, Join the Recognitions. Here's uh, one MOSFET. You can see the other one is cracked, so we took out both MOSFETs at the same time. Let's try this again. I wonder if the diodes are still good. I wonder what's all still good on here. I'm thinking just both the gates turn on at the same time. Is that one or we need two? Why did I just hand you only one? <laughs> I don't know, Jeremiah. It's been a long night. Okay. Stay tuned. Ooh, that's, that's looking fresh. You should put that right back on. What? You just need to glue the top back on. <laughs> need to glue the top back <laughs> Oh, fine, fine. <laughs> Jeremiah, I'm, miss the oven at I'm missing. Uh, here, I don't know how to glue this wire back on, Jeremiah. <laughs> hey, at least you still got pads to attach. <laughs> right? It could be worse. I vaporized those off my boards many uh, a time. Hey, I still got diodes to attach. Uh, it's different when they're not signal traces. Well, that starts out good. All right, new fats. It's switching? Oh, you can't hear that, can you? I can't hear it, no. My <laughs> hearing is gone. Oh, yeah, is it switching? Switching just freaking fine. Oh, you removed the cap. I have frequently lowered saturation just as you said. Nope. You want to try this? Uh, tell me what to do, boss. Well, this time, I would highly recommend you have your camera placed so that if and or when this blows up, which it probably will, 
you know. Well, at least we'll get the footage of it blowing up. Alright. You ready? Oh, well. Oh, <laughs> that was better than expected. <laughs> well, that didn't last as long as last time. So uh, now I have the 4714 S&P MOSFETs. I looked them up. They say that they're 30 volts at 20 amps. However, the power dissipation isn't that great. So what I've done here uh, on those MOSFETs is I've given them little heat sinks. Uh, there's two heat sinks, one on each source and then one on each of the drains. So drain heat sink tabs and then these little guys in the back are on the source. Got a little inductor on here. You can see the two MOSFETs, the two diodes. It's the exact same circuit diagram. And then I got my little transformer. Got my resonant catheter. Ah, bleh. <clears throat> got my resonant capacitor. And my inductor. This board will be nice and easy because uh, I'll be able to swap inductors on this board pretty easy. I have it connected to this little neon tube. So I haven't run it yet. Um, I have tested it with the LEDs. Focus that. Uh, and uh, this will be the first time running it with this bulb. So I have no idea whether it's going to work or not. Uh, we'll uh, put some power into it. Probably should make this top of these a little longer. I have an 8 and 8 primary on there. It's a pretty thick coil and I have it covered up by a piece of little sill uh, thermal insulation material. Now with longer wires for the power cut, let's see what this does real quick. Okay, so that's pretty good. It does light up. See if anything gets warm. Oh yeah, those MOSFETs are pretty cool right now. Run a little longer. There's weird energy fluctuations in there when it starts up. Let's see if anything is warm on that circuit. Transformers cool. Inductors are cool. Now those MOSFETs are a little warm, but uh, that's okay. So, uh, we're going to be using uh, the voltage drop. It's kind of an indicator of where we are as far as current draw. So if you see, I'll uh, turn this on. You see the voltage drop down to 3.4 and back up to uh, the 4 volt range. So, um, we're going to change out some inductors and see what changes as far as the voltage drop here. And uh, see what we can get as far as efficiency. Uh, versus the kind of power output we want. I've also got some other inductors here as well that I'll be uh, swapping out and putting in to kind of give you guys some ideas of a little bit more of what some of these inductors do. Kind of their uh, relative place in the circuit. Uh, grab this little guy too. Alright, so now with all those grabbed, start our uh, testing. So, let's move this little inductor right here. Uh, let's go back to testing this guy. So, a little bit more efficient Let's try this little guy right here oh 
Oh, that's less efficient for sure. So we're going to put that one over here. Let's try this guy. So the goal, because there's not much heat sinking on this VBS, is to try to find a reasonably uh, cool and uh, low current application, low current inductor uh, schematic for this, uh, or setup, not schematic, because uh, we don't want those MOSFETs to get too warm and fail. Or solder on those pads. Oh yeah, gotta turn up the light for you guys, right? There, now you can kind of see what I'm doing. Okay, mm -hmm. continuing on with this. See how this one sets in? Nope, still not as efficient. Let's try two inductors. So right now I'm putting the inductors in series. No, about the same. Let's try changing out the capacitor. So I'm going to put a smaller capacitor in. See what that changes. Uh, with the uh, smaller capacitor, the transformer will ring a little bit better. Ring a little faster. Hopefully get the efficiency up a little bit more. see what we get with that oh right there awesome so a little bit more efficient with that smaller cap right off the bat glad to see that see. Uh, just show you uh, the kind of efficiency this has without an inductor and yes you can run these without an inductor uh, this is where I risk blowing things up so I won't run it very quick uh, especially with the full battery no, it goes right down to 3 volts. Yeah, these MOSFETs don't like to run without an inductor. That's strange. Some, some transformers and stuff do. It's kind of odd. Like, you wouldn't expect it to work, but it actually does work. Let's try a heavier inductor. Maybe that'll kick off and uh, draw a bit more current. We can see uh, that current go up as a voltage drop with some output. But it went right to 3 volts, so right there. Not working. Very, very inefficient. Probably a solid latch state right there. 3.2, so with a heavier one, much, 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 much more current draw. I think I'm going to go with that little guy for now, see what happens. So this inductor is probably not ready to take the power, but it gave us really good results. So Let's see if anything is warm. Oh yeah, those MOSFETs are hot. So you can see right now off the bat that uh, this is going to generate a lot of heat. I just checked it and those MOSFETs are extremely warm right now. Okay. I mean, you need a smaller cap or even a smaller inductor still to get that to run pretty cool. Oh, that hardly draws anything right there. Hmm. We might be onto something here. Or bypass that. See if we get a heavier uh, load on that transformer, it may oscillate a little bit better. With balanced systems like this, uh, it is a balanced system. Uh, oscillating circuits have to be kind of balanced for uh their application so it can be a little bit of a trick to get the circuit to be exactly balanced to where you want it to be so now we got really efficient but we don't really have much light output let's try this still very efficient I wonder we're going to go disconnect this I'm betting it'll light up a regular fluorescent pretty easy 
So, I'm going to go get, grab that regular fluorescent. we got a really efficient ZBS circuit right now. And uh, if we can use that. Another project that uh, I'm probably going to post up. Uh, as you can see, I actually put one of the little ZBS power supplies in here. And uh, there's a little battery pack. And uh, I got a little switch and a little charge port here. And actually, uh, Jeremiah brought up a good point where yeah, there's enough room that I could probably just fit a full phone charger circuit in there and uh, just have it recharge with uh, screwing it into the light bulb socket. So I'm going to close that up. And now I'm going to turn it on. Right there, a little handy uh, light bulb. Right there, turn it off. That's uh, pretty cool. So uh, I think I'm going to do a tutorial on this as well. Uh, that's pretty neat. This is one of the little MOSFETs. I'm going to be using similar MOSFETs as this guy. And uh, these are usually about 30 volts and uh, good for a decent amount of amperage. Depends on the data sheet. I'm going to flip this over. And you can see there's a big pad and there's four little pins. So if you look at the four little pins, so counting from the top. We have uh, the three pins right here, pin one, which is uh, pin one, two, and three, uh, which is the source, and then the pin four, which is the gate, and then the rest of them, which is drain. So that's drain right there. And so I've got a couple of these already mounted up, actually. Kind of see here, this configuration. So got that white wire which is my gate and the other ones are on the source and I've got my entire drain on this metal sheet for power dissipation right heat dissipation not power dissipation um, on this right here uh, underneath I'm using two of these absolutely no uh, thermal sinking so I'm assuming that they will get pretty warm if not melt apart and I've got a little static sprayer right here this is from a printer uh, I also have the same 470 ohm, <coughs> 470 ohm resistors <coughs> and little uh, 1000 volt diodes. Uh, I'm going to turn the light off. And you can see that I have the meter right now at 3.7 volts. So I'm going to go ahead and connect the positive. You'll see some sparks now. I'm going to turn up the uh, voltage a little bit more. Let's try 4.7 volts. Oh, a lot better. And we're drawing about half an amp, two amps. That's a lot of current. I'm going to turn on the light and see where, uh, where our failure is going to be. I'm assuming there is going to be a failure just because of the lack of heat sinking. But of course, because of the nature of this video, I definitely want to show you where the failure states are. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on that light again. And we'll just run it and see what happens. So once again, uh, about 5 volts into this circuit. About 3 amps. So you can see it almost instantly stops wor working. And the MOSFETs heat up quite a bit. And the whole system just kind of degrades. <clears throat> so, we give that a couple of seconds to cool down. The MOSFET should be in a better conducting state. And the, the circuit should work again, just as it did before. Okay, with that back connected, now it should work just fine. Nope. Apparently that MOSFET is toast. Looks like uh, looks like it thermally overloaded. I'm going to make sure that capacitor is discharged. And that MOSFET is, is gone. Okay, here now I have the same little... Uh, electrostatic sprayer. And I have this little board. I've already done the LED test on. So I'm going to go ahead and connect this little board up to that little ion sprayer. This is the board with the heat sink on it and those really slim form factor 30 volt MOSFETs. So if you look underneath here, uh, this is just a heat sink on the top of that board. And you can see that there are the MOSFETs. So it's actually right underneath there. 
So they're the little black bits inside. Of course, the two uh, drains. Uh, the diodes and resistors are right there. So you got the little uh, 1K resistors and then uh, the little SMT diodes right here. So this is the board that I'm going to be using. So I'm going to hook this up. So positive wire from the batteries to the inductor. It's per usual. Need more solder. Okay, now that that's connected up, uh, if it works, then we know that the transformer primary wasn't damaged from that last run. However, if it doesn't work, oh, well, if it works, yeah, if it doesn't work, then we know that uh, the transformer needs to be redone. So, uh, the transformer could have been damaged from just giving it that last test run. Of course, uh, once the circuit failed and gave all that other heat, they gave all that power through only one side of the circuit, then connect positive, disconnect positive, connect negative. Um, okay, <clears throat> because the circuit locked up and was in a latch state when it failed, a lot of extra energy was going to the transformer primary, which means that it could have suffered heat damage rather easily. So hopefully, <coughs> hopefully that was not the case. So I'm going to go ahead and connect this up. Still at the same uh, about 4.4 volts that we had before last time. So move that over so uh, you can also see what's going on with the current. It's probably the worst meter in history to read. Turn off the light. So now you can see the the meter. And I got the circuit here, and we should get our uh, electric, which we do. Awesome. So <clears throat> let's run this. Let's see how much current we're drawing on this circuit. You can see that current just climb up as that system heats up. So I'm gonna let that cool down. Feel how warm that heatsink got. Oh yeah, that board is mildly warm. That board got warm really quick. So basically what happens is, is as the MOSFETs get warm, their on resistance increases. And when their on resistance increases, they have a loss of conductivity. Uh, yeah, adequating into uh, more heat production and less power output. So once again, I'll run that. MOSFETs have cooled down. You're going to see that current climb up as the MOSFETs get warm. And of course, then as they get warm, the output function does not work as well. So we got our voltage, which is going to drop. And we got our current right here, um, which is right now at 0, 0.00 amp. So once again, watch that current climb as the MOSFETs get warm. And that happens because of inadequate MOSFET cooling. So, we'll give it a couple of seconds to cool down again. So that's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty concerning number right there. We we'll probably fix that number. Beep beep beep. We we'll probably fix that number with a uh, a smaller inductor. So I'll probably go ahead and do that now. So they just turn on the light again. We have for inductors. Uh, let's try a three or three in there. It's still pretty heavy, but I also got to watch out now because uh, it's that capacitor. It's going to have a couple of thousand volts in it at this point, and. Uh, 
not exactly a bad thing to get shocked by, but it's not exactly the most pleasant thing either. It's the equivalent to a mosquito bite, um, as far as electrical terms. But uh, that's not saying that I'm going to go out and willingly get bitten by a bunch of mosquitoes. I'm going to turn this down again so you can see. Uh, once again, the same meter, different inductor. Now you get to watch the current climb or not to see how the uh, system is balanced. So much lower current draw right off the bat. You can hold steady, which it looks like it is. So right there, just changing the amount of current on the circuit uh, will make it run a lot more efficient even though it's using less energy. Start to climb, but not as quick. And there it goes. So, let's see if that was the transformer or the MOSFETs. Um, same thing with magnetics. When magnetics heat up, they also take a little bit more power. Oh yeah, that's warm. That is quite warm. Let's see how this is doing. Not bad. The board's not bad. The transformer. Is definitely a little warmer. Let's go ahead and throw another inductor like that in. That performed a lot better. It's a R36. For 100. R5. What is that guy? 3R3. Aww, do I have another 3R3? right here. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and put these two inductors together. Actually see what we get. So I'm going to swap out that inductor yet again. See if we can get a lower current draw. Uh, using an inductor, I mean really you have to kind of sit there and test out a bunch of different inductors. And all that an inductor really is, as you can see, is just essentially wire wrapped around something magnetic. That's all it is. Um, anything magnetic will work, essentially. Um, of course, with the ferrites, you have the advantages of using um, higher speeds, but you can still make iron inductors if needed. Um, I mean, anything that's magnetic. You can use a piece of transformer core uh, for an inductor if you really needed to. Yeah, those, those will work pretty good. So uh, here's that board again. Now you can see uh, uh, what those new inductors do. So about... 2 amps, which is the opposite direction of where we want to go. Let's turn that off. So choosing the right inductor can honestly take quite a bit of time. So as I said, especially if you don't have inductors to play with. Um, and even if you do, just balancing out one of these circuits can be a really difficult thing. I'll uh, remove those, those guys. Come on, release. There you go. So, let's, let's try this inductor. See how this guy does. See it? Also about two amps. So far the best inductor was uh, that little 3R3. I really uh, would like to find another little 3R3. This is this guy here. Ah, oh, success. So, now we got two 3R3s. I'm betting that uh, this will work very well. Probably bring it down to about half an amp. So, 
Not a very strong circuit. But stable is what we want for the time being, hopefully. All right, now with those two three R threes. check and see what's warm now. I'm assuming the transformer is a little warm. Nope, transformer is cool. MOSFETs are mildly warm. The inductors are a little warm. Uh, yeah, that looks like a really stable circuit for the time being. Okay, well that's good. We found a good match for this. Well, let's go ahead and test it a little bit more. I'm going to open up the spark gap here. Just uh, short it out something first. And, uh, let's see what kind of a spark we can actually get out of that now. Oh, that's a much fatter spark. All right, let's see how that draws on the current. Although it should be pretty much the same. There might be a little bit more. I'm asking a little bit more out of it, but find out. So you can see it a little bit better. Right here. All right. The spark gap is a little wide. See how everything is doing. Still very cool. Close that a little bit more. So, let's test it on a single lithium ion cell worth voltage, which is uh, 4.2 volts maximum charge. Disconnect that. 
check the temperatures out. Mildly warm on the transformer. A little warm on the inductor. No temperature change on the caps and a little warm on the driver. And that driver is a little warm, but like it's not unstable at this point. So that should be nearly able to run indefinitely. I'm not, uh, I'm not dissatisfied with that. All right, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually go ahead and I'm going to remove that capacitor. We'll see how much voltage we're actually getting out of here now. Start drawing arcs from it. Uh, and that's going to put it underneath a little bit more of a load, but that's okay. This is for science. Turn that off. Connect some of my wires here. So yeah, fair bit of a little, uh, little bit of a voltage coming out that multiplier. It's a little voltage over here, and give you uh, more of a better view of that. Fortunately, the camera is just a piece of shit. Raise the voltage up a little higher. See, we get on 5 volts. Of course, the higher the voltage is raised, the more the current will want to go up. Not bad. Bring it up to uh, 5.8, so 6 volts. Let's start to see if things really do continue to work or not. Let's bring it up to 6.5 volts. Actually, the current is doing really well, which I'm surprised at. I like to keep that current down. So, oh, yeah, now we're starting to see the current climb a little bit. Let's go up to 7 volts. So now drawing 3, 4 amps out of that. Ooh, something's getting warm. So far, so so. Ran up to eight volts. Bring up to nine volts. Bring it up to uh, 10 volts. We uh, should start to be uh, jumping that gap now. Nope, not yet. Let's 
13 volts. Sorry, 12 volts, 11 volts, that's 12 volts now. Yeah, look at that. So now, whew, now we're getting some failures. I smell them. I'm betting that's my transformer primary. Oh yeah, that bugger is heating up. So uh, let's see how bad the problem is, eh? Yeah, I just taxed without my meter right away now. Is it still working? Oh yeah. I am going to close these wires up. That way you can see uh, the electrical arc between them at this voltage. So let's see what that sets us. Oh yeah. Move that over. So we got that right there. So turn that on. See if you can see that still which you easily can. All right, <clears throat> so here we go. Let's see what fails. Look at that. Continuing with this little circuit. Uh, right now it's at 12 volts. And uh, the wires for the spark right here, the output, were actually the weak spot. Uh, so now after replacing that one with a piece of silicone insulated wire, uh, we can go back to trying this and see how it holds up. So, once again, Gonna turn off the light just so you can see a little bit more. That's the exact same setup, so let's have a little fun with that. Uh, we'll see if that jumps on its own or if I have to draw it out. Not drawing on its own. Gonna close that out just a little bit. I think we're gonna get a nice good uh, arc off that side. So I'm going to draw it again. So, trying about 4 amps there at 12 volts. <laughs> Just to establish that arc. Keep that arc established. I'm going to try and make it smaller. There we go. So, right now I'm drawing. Oh, you can see it go down. Yeah, look got warm. Those got warm. Yeah, the MOSFETs right now are getting quite warm. That uh, 12 volts. Of course, drawing that more amperage because uh, we uh, raise the voltage. All right. Well, let's say we can get a little, little bit of the stable output with that. So, I'm gonna close that spark a little bit. Gonna turn on the light just in case uh, you want to see where any failure is in uh, the circuit. Um, but we'll just let it run for a while after that arc is established. Turn down the voltage. I think what's going on is just going to get warm.
Uh oh. Let's see. So, even that wasn't adequate to cool those MOSFETs down. Uh, oh, that's hot. As you can see, this connection got so warm, uh, it unsoldered itself. Discharge that real quick. Ooh, that's hot. Those are warm. Yeah, so we were pushing that system well outside of its maximum. So our biggest problem right now is just general cooling. Yeah, you can see a little bit of the hot glue around here that is starting to liquefy in that. But I'm assuming the circuit is just fine. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, re of that wire, double check this circuit. And uh, after that's double checked, making sure that it still works, uh, I'll probably end up using this circuit in something too, because it is a nice little circuit. With that wire reconnected, go ahead and give it a test again. And uh, see, this, this is going to be just fine. Absolutely. So obviously this little power supply um, has some issues, mostly overheating, still in the MOSFETs, uh, mostly because uh, I don't have a direct contact between uh, the bottom pad for the drain, which is where most of the heat gets sent out, uh, and then the heat sink. So effectively all the plastic up on, all the plastic on the, uh, the top here is acting like an insulating barrier. So I can't really get rid of the heat, plus that heat sink is rather small. Okay, interesting uh, setup that I got. No diodes in here, replacing different parts. So I've uh, replaced the diode functions with these two in parallel 470 ohm resistors, giving us about 235 ohms. And uh, then for the uh, positive input resistors, instead of the 470 ohm, now I'm using 2.2 kilo ohm resistors. And uh, we're gonna test the function of the circuit using the LED test that I've shown before. And look, one LED comes on, so that's a good promise right there. Uh, I'm going to take and uh, switch it now, so over to the unnegative side, or sorry, unlit side, so testing. Yeah, that seems to work really well, actually. No problem with that. Uh -oh. <clears throat> no problem with that. That seems to be working decently well. So let's go ahead, uh, let's go ahead and test that, see what happens. Put on a transformer and test the real world application. Alright, uh, I've taken and I put the transformer on our ZVS without the diodes on there. So all resistors in this configuration. Uh, and it's at 5 volts right now. So we're going to put this in uh, practical application, test it out. seeing anything. What's going on? Oh, all right, well, uh, as you can see, we now have a definitive reason why uh, it is definitely better to use diodes. Uh, that didn't work. And uh, that MOSFET got very hot. Oh, both of them got very hot. And uh, there was no transformer oscillation. Okay, so I have one more ZVS here. I'm going to do a few things with this. I've got a different bit of a setup now on here. I've added a few things for testing purposes. The second part to using a ZVS circuit is actually balancing the circuit, which is a little bit tricky especially if you don't know much about resonant systems. There are three parts you're going to be focusing on for the balancing part. So, essentially, when you have your basic ZVS circuit build, now you're going to have to worry about the actual hard part. So we have three parts. We have the inductor, the resonant capacitor, and a high voltage transformer in this case. So whether it's a step up, step down transformer uh, isn't really important 
um, but you're going to have to tune the transformer to work at its maximum efficiency. And that's basically making sure that the circuit is properly oscillating the magnetics, or the electricity, and make the magnetics flip back and forth at the proper saturation of the transformer. Not doing this uh, can make the system work ineffectively uh, and overdrive certain parts on the circuit, such as the MOSFETs, making them warmer than necessary. So, the setup includes a couple of things. First of all, on this side, I have this uh, little bank of capacitors. I have half of them on right now and half of them off. So, eight in total. I've got them wired up here. So, that way I can just test out where to set the capacitor for my resonant capacitor. So, I've got it at the halfway point, as I said. So, half of these are on the circuit and half of these aren't. As you can see, these yellow wires go directly to this point and to this point right here across the resident capacitor that I have in there already. Uh, the other thing that I have here coming off is you can see that this wire is connected to this heat sink as this wire is connected to that heat sink. And these heat sinks are separated because these are each of our MOSFET drains in this case. After that, we have a rectifying Scotty diode, and we have this little capacitor here. So this is going to smooth the voltage, the DC voltage, uh, that's coming off the differential between this MOSFET drain and this MOSFET drain. And we're measuring the voltage, actually, uh, that is flipping back and forth in this capacitor, or effectively, uh, the voltage that is flipping back and forth between the outside coils of our primary. So we're not measuring off the center tap, but we're measuring currently right now here and on the other side. Same thing as here and here. Uh, on this meter here, you can see it says zero volts right now. Put the camera up and I'm going to show you that testing and how that is useful information. Okay, <clears throat> so we have this little test apparatus set up, and uh, so far I have right now 6 volts coming off the power supply, it's not drawing any power, of course, because it's not connected, and uh, we're getting nothing between the two outside legs of the transformer, well, because it's not connected. I have four extra caps capacitors on the resonant capacitor, so I've added capacitance into the circuit um, as far as the resonant circuit goes. So, what effect does that have on the current draw, the input voltage, and the output voltage on the transformer's primary? We're drawing about 3 amps. Voltage didn't drop, so about 6 volts still. 16 here. So, we're getting about 3 times the voltage as our input voltage. And we're drawing a lot of power. So, let's add two more capacitors onto the circuit. See if that brings up our efficiency. So, now you can see we're drawing about 4 amps. We have less voltage here, so we're drawing more power. We've got less power output. So, that's not right either. So let's subtract. Now I'm going to remove the two additional capacitors that I added. So now there's less capacitance than I started off this test with. I'm going to see what happens. So now we're getting a little bit more voltage here and uh, we're still drawing, we're drawing less current. So we're drawing about 2 amps now. Uh, and we're getting about three times the voltage doubling here. So let's drop it down even further, see what happens. We're going to take off all the extra capacitors in the circuit. And uh, I'm going to reconnect it and we can see what happens. So the light bulb is not as bright we're not pushing nearly as much current, but our voltage went up. So, 
we're drawing less power. We've got a little bit more voltage on there. Now I'm going to add what capacitor, see what happens. It's right there. Uh, about 2 amps, 17 volts. And that's a pretty linear effect as well. Um, you'll see that uh, if I lower the voltage. So 4 volts. I uh, should be getting, yeah, about 4 volts to 10, so a little bit more over half. So if I raise it up now, bring it up to like 9 volts. You'll see that voltage climb there and the current climb. So I'm going to turn that off. I'm going to remove that little capacitor there. And uh, we'll see what happens now. So 9 volts. So drawing a lot less current, which is good. Uh, it's not as bright, but we're getting a lot more voltage too. And it's running cool. So, that, I like how it runs. But you can see how the capacitors start to play a major role in the balancing of your system. So, I recommend playing around with different uh, bipolar capacitors. You cannot use electrolytics. Uh, they must be bipolar and they must also be able to support relatively high switching speeds. Otherwise, they'll get pretty warm. Um, Let's uh, some let's do some inductor tests and see how the inductor also plays a role in tuning your circuit. I've extended this wire from the center tap of the transformer to the inductor. Gonna turn on my soldering iron and uh, gonna get started with that. So uh, we're gonna still continue to measure the voltage that is generated uh, from each one of these, uh, or it's from the differential from the MOSFET drains across that full coil. Um, this is the original configuration, so from the 6 volts here we're going to get about 17, 18, so about there, 18 volts. Uh, it's pretty stable. So we're going to turn that off, see what else we can do. First thing I just want to note, actually I'll leave that on for the, for the time being just so I can show you something interesting, if it works. Uh, I'm going to turn the light off of this, turn that light on. We're actually going to fully remove the inductor at this point. I hope you can see that voltage, I'm going to tilt out the meter so you can see that again. Uh, we're going to remove this inductor sometimes. The circuit works fine without the inductor. Sometimes not. So, with the inductor, we're uh, drawing about 1 amp and we're getting 18 volts. We're going to completely remove the inductor now altogether and uh, put those two leads directly together. And uh, we're going to see what the current and the voltage does in the circuit. So, those are together now. Uh, in circuit, there is no inductor, so those are just directly together. So, see what happens. So it draws a lot of current, about 5 amps, 53 volts. So that's no current limiting on that at all, and we get a lot more voltage. Uh, so we have lost the ability to regulate most of the current going through our system. With the inductor, the current consumption will drop significantly. So, I've got a couple of inductors I'm going to show you. Uh, some of these things to watch out for and how to find the proper inductor. So there I go. I'm going to grab a couple of inductors. Uh, this one right here, I'm going to test. Test this guy. Test this big one. And uh, we'll grab these as well. Uh, let's grab a couple of small ones and just kind of go through those. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. So we got a bunch of different inductors, and basically, an inductor is any, as I said, basically any type of material. You can grab a piece of magnetic material, wrap it around. So if you don't have an inductor, and you need an inductor, and you cannot find an inductor, uh, it's simple to make an inductor. Grab some wire, it has to have a coating on it. You can just actually wrap it around like this. So we can actually use this screwdriver as our inductor in this case. Because it is, I think, a magnetic screwdriver. We'll go check that out. Oh yeah, it's magnetic. Uh, actually, we're going to put this inductor in. Now that we got an inductor to put in. See what this guy does. Literally that easy. So, there you go. I've just made an inductor from scratch. Now, because it's a, a steel material, of course, um, it's going to be rather slow, so I expect this to be a really uh, ineffective <laughs> inductor. But we're going to see exactly what changes on the meter. Uh, I'm curious to see how well of an inductor a screwdriver, some network cable will actually be. So, I'm going to pop that off. So, not a very good inductor, of course. But, it's kind of working. So, uh, as you can see, once it's stabilized, it was uh, drawing a lot less current, uh, and it in fact did work. So, very easy way to make an inductor. But so, let's test out some inductors here, see what happens. So, let's try this big inductor first. See what happens with this guy. Now, since this inductor is really big, has a lot of windings, I expect this guy to be really inefficient. So actually about the same uh, as the other inductors, drawing half an amp, uh, still giving us a reasonably good voltage, which is cool. And uh, we can see a little bit of spiking on the inductor, they go, the voltage will go up and down a little bit. Um, there you go, once again, 18 there. So it's not a very stable inductor in this circuit. There's some counter resonance between it and the transformer that you see spiking there. So, let's turn that back on. Let's uh, pick out a different inductor and see if we can get a cleaner, better signal. So, I'm just going to step down in sizes. So we got this inductor. Pop that on. See what happens. Oops. That's it. So right there, 1.2 amps, 17 volts. See how the voltage is. Everything is pretty stable with this inductor. This would be totally suitable as well. So turn it back on. Move that over. Go, uh, go pick this guy right here. So we'll test this circuit. So one amp. So we're seeing that uh, the inductors use pretty much when they're stabilized. Uh, we're getting about the same results. About 0.7 uh, to 1 amp and about three times the voltage as we're putting in. Let's continue with this. Use this little guy right here. Turn that off. So, once again, about the same. This is actually really stable. Uh, the voltage is remaining really constant at 17.93 volts. It's pretty good. I like this inductor. So, 
that's a pretty good inductor as well for this circuit. In fact, it's a really stable inductor for this circuit. Uh, let's try this inductor. You see how the meter just shot up to 70 volts there real quick. Uh, and now, nothing is working. So what happened? Uh, I suspect that we got a spike from the inductor, and it actually took out our MOSFET. So we probably have just destroyed one of those MOSFETs because of the inductive spike off that inductor, which is why you want a really suitable inductor for your circuit. Uh, you can also prevent this by putting Zener diodes across your MOSFETs with the Zener diode cathode on the gate side and your Zener diode anode side on your drain, or not drain, uh, on your source. So you'd be putting the diode across there. But yes, essentially what just happened now, uh, I believe, yep, we got a dead MOSFET. They either got a dead MOSFET or a dead diode. But yes, yeah, so you can see where inductive spike is bad. So watch out for that or protect your MOSFET gates like I have on the bigger driver. I'll show you what I mean by that. So on here, this is a Zener diode. And uh, here I have the Zener diode this said the cathode on the gate and I have the anode on the source so that way if a spike occurs on the inductor your gate will be protected so uh, the data sheet specifies that these MOSFETs have a 30 volt gate and uh, I just had a 75 volt spike so that means on average we had a uh, nearly 40 volt spike on each MOSFET gate. So that's not surprising seeing that. With the meter on the diode check, I am going to test these MOSFETs. So I'm going to put my negative on the MOSFET source. I'm going to test the drain, which you can see is bad. I'm also going to test the gate, which you can see is also bad. You can actually use LEDs to test this too, and a battery. I'm going to show you that. So, here is what a good MOSFET is. A good MOSFET looks like on the meter. So, uh, same thing. Are you charged? Sometimes the gates will stay charged. So I'm going to deplete that gate real quick. So that way I'm not getting a bad uh, signal on that. Yep, so with that gate depleted, that's checking good, and that's checking good. So cool. So that's a good MOSFET. As I said, you can also do the same thing with uh, an LED. So here I've got a battery, this is a cell phone battery, and uh, so I've got a negative, and then I got the LED connected to the positive, and then the LED negative coming out. So as you would see it light up like that. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to use the negative. I'm going to touch the negative of, or I'm going to touch the source of the MOSFET. I'm going to touch the drain pin. You can see that LED lights up. And uh, on the gate, the LED also lights up. Let me show you on a good MOSFET the difference. So here's a good MOSFET. So touch that here. God, these things are sensitive. 
drain that gate. So the LED doesn't light up once again with that gate drained and it doesn't light up on here. So yep, and the gate got charged up again. Uh what I mean by that is a MOSFET will actually stay on uh if it's not drained and that can kind of get a little confusing. So before checking a MOSFET, just make sure that the gate is completely drained first. I'll kind of show you a little bit more about that. So for example, if I test it, the uh, LED doesn't come on, but if I give the gate a positive charge now, across these two, so now that will effectively stay on, and now the LED will light up, which it does. This will also affect how the MOSFET tests. So now, for example, if I test this MOSFET across the source and the drain, it's going to test bad. Now when I go and drain that gate capacitance, I can recheck it, and it reads perfectly fine. So with that, let's use the LED test to see if we can actually figure out whether this MOSFET's good or bad. Nope. Those leads shouldn't touch. Okay, uh, so I'm going to do the same thing, just uh, I'm going to connect it to the source. So the drain looks on, and uh, we're getting some conductivity across the gate, uh, which, as you can see, we really shouldn't ever be getting. So no conductivity. So let's check with the meter, see what the meter says. So on source, checking drain. And that's dead. Checking the gate. Let's check this gate. So, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just verify that this MOSFET may not be bad. Uh, and I'm going to do that just by draining the gate and rechecking it. I'm going to do yet, I think, one more round of just observational testing. And that is actually for the resistors going to the MOSFET gates. So, <clears throat> I have here a couple of varieties. Uh, these are all the 470 ohm resistors. It's like said I have quite a lot of these so I chose to use them. So here's the equivalent of the original pair which is uh, 470 ohms to each MOSFET. We'll see how that changes things. So I'm going to just tin all the ends and pop this in circuit. And uh, then positive wire at the top. Oops, a little too quick. So, see how that runs? So, turn up the voltage. We're going to bring it up to that same 6 volts. It's just a good range to test with this. Uh, we're going to connect that positive. See what the current draw took about a one amp continuous. Well, it lit up and uh, dropped down. So about 0.7 amps continuous. Okay. That's one measurement. Let's go play around with those uh, resistors a little bit more. Uh, let's decrease the amount of resistance. I've got uh, these two, which are in series giving us 980 ohms. 
a piece. So that's two four hundred and seventy seven nine hundred and eighty ohms. Yeah, da, da. That's off. Two hundred and uh sorry. <clears throat> four hundred and seventy, that's four hundred and seventy, so nine hundred and forty ohms. That's what it is. Let's see, four hundred and seventy four yeah. Well, it's double the resistance. So about a kilo ohm between these, so we're gonna see what double that resistance does now. So it's near the uh, one kilo ohm range. This is about uh, 900 ohms actually. I don't have a calculator right in front of me. But all right, so let's see what effect that had. So about one kilo ohm from about 500 ohms. So you can see we're drawing. A little more current overall so not so much of a non-signal those MOSFETs meaning that uh, they're probably not switching as hard as they could be meaning uh, that there's a little bit more on state resistance in the circuit uh, if you are increasing voltage in your circuit so for example if you're uh, using a 20 or 30 volt circuit probably want to shoot for one kilo ohm to two kilo ohms if you're using a lower voltage circuit uh, you're going to be relying more so on the current to switch those MOSFETs on more than the voltage so uh, these are the two 470 ohms giving us 235 ohms to each so about one quarter of a kilo ohm now so half the resistance which could either raise or lower the efficiency of the circuit. We'll tell uh, by how much amperage is being drawn once it's connected. Uh, the reason why you wouldn't want to run such a low resistance on a higher voltage circuit is because the more volts you put in underneath a lower resistance ohm, the more wattage it consumes and the more heat it will create. So, once again, uh, six volt range. Uh, let's see what this does. Absolutely nothing. Here is a little LED driver board, it's a three key LED driver board, and on here there are three end channel MOSFETs. Uh, so each one of these little black things are an end channel MOSFET, and these pretty much are wired up like other little three pin MOSFETs, uh, where you have the source on the right, the gate on the left, and the drain in the middle, and looking at the numbers. The other type of SMT MOSFET that I've used is the weird 8 pin MOSFETs and I'll explain those to you. Firstly I'll explain to you kind of on the board here so here's one on the board that I've removed I'll point that out so uh, you'll see four pins here one two three and four and you'll see four pins right here one two three four so the same thing like you see four pins here and four pins here you'll notice that uh, these pins are tied together and uh, this lighter material has copper underneath it. I've scraped away some of it right here and uh, you can see the copper and uh, this dark material doesn't have any copper underneath it. So uh, these three right here looking at it actually from this direction probably a little bit less confusing. So figure this is pin 1, pin 2, and pin 3 which are usually your source. And here's pin four, which is your gate. You'll see that these four pins right here are connected, which are the drain. Some MOSFETs actually have two MOSFETs inside of them. So for example, this little guy right here, is actually a pair of MOSFETs 
So you would have source gate source gate drain and drain. Looking at the other type of MOSFET, which was also conveniently found on this board, I am going to flip it around and show you the same pin out here on this MOSFET. So here we can see that uh, once again, pin 1, 2, and 3 are together, and pin 4 is the gate. Uh, we have this big pad right here, uh, which is the drain, as you can see is connected to these four, and uh, that big pad right there is a thermal pad and what that does is it takes heat away from the MOSFET and dumps it into the motherboard so that way the MOSFETs themselves run cooler. Uh, on this board you also notice a couple of other things as well I'm going to point out so for capacitors we have these little guys right here these tan guys uh, which are tantalum capacitors and uh, you can see right here there's a C right next to that and that'll tell you uh, what it is is a capacitor and a lot of those capacitors are bipolar in fact most of them are and that's specifically uh, labeled uh, first so for example we'll go over to this capacitor here and uh, this capacitor has a labeled end here which is the input for I believe the positive on these capacitors um, you cannot use an electrolytic like this which is a small electrolytic capacitor so I'm here I believe this is still your negative side. Um, this is not a bipolar capacitor either, so it cannot be used for the uh, resonant capacitor. And we have a bunch of inductors as well. And inductors are either labeled uh, with a L or an R. So right here is an inductor. And uh, here's another inductor. I'm moving over here actually another inductor and uh, these are pretty easy to tell because they're just a piece of magnetic material with a closed ferrite core as I said it's uh, and you got some wire in there so let's take a look at some other MOSFETs and stuff Alright, so here we have a old Dell motherboard. It's the same thing here. We have a bunch of parts. Uh, let's point out some of those MOSFETs. So you can see some of those areas that have a high capacitor region right here. And uh, most often those high capacitor regions are accompanied by the MOSFETs and inductors. So uh, it might be a voltage regulator, could be a MOSFET. I have not looked at the data sheet for that. These two, most definitely a pair of MOSFETs in the synchronous buck setup. Right here, uh, between this capacitor, I, I'm not seeing, uh, sorry, between these capacitors, uh, here's another component. Uh, probably bending it's a, another type of voltage regulator, simply because I don't see an inductor around it. And uh, by the CPU uh, socket and the memory, we're going to see more of the MOSFETs and inductors. So uh, all in this area, oh, here's the inductor, so that's a MOSFET, that's a MOSFET, that's a MOSFET, and that's a MOSFET. The one thing I wanted to point out on here is uh, you'll see two types of different MOSFETs and 90% uh, of the MOSFETs that you're going to find in consumer electronics are n-channel enhanced mode MOSFETs just because they're the most efficient to run. So uh, you'll see two different types of MOSFETs here. You'll see these types, and uh, you'll notice that they look a little different than these types. And that's because in synchronous buck, sometimes what they'll do is they'll have a higher voltage, lower current side, and for the rectifying, they'll have a higher current, uh, lower voltage side. It's a step-down configuration that takes the uh, 16 volts and uh, steps it down to the 2 to 3 volts that the CPU actually operates on. And same thing here, we see the uh, ATX 4 pin input for the 12 volts. You'll notice that uh, there's another toroidal inductor there. And uh, two more MOSFETs for that setup as well. well let's take a look at the Xbox 360 Slim motherboard. So basically it's the same thing, same thing on almost every motherboard. Uh, we'll have these different components. The same thing over here, a single capacitor, and what I'm assuming 
is uh, either a MOSFET or a voltage rectifier, or a voltage, uh, linear voltage regulator, uh, VC1, probably, uh, definitely looks like uh, it's labeled, uh, such as a voltage regulator would be. So, let's move over here, and uh, we'll notice that this area, once again, is uh, populated by these capacitors here, and populated by these capacitors here, and uh, we see the same kind of setup going on where we have the inductors as well. So we have a bunch of MOSFETs as well here. So this is a MOSFET right here. That's a MOSFET, that's a MOSFET, that's a MOSFET, that's a MOSFET. And these little chips right here, I see one chip here, and one chip here. Those are the synchronous buck drivers. Uh, there's another inductor here, as well as another toroidal inductor in this area. And same thing with the two MOSFETs. Once again, one for pumping the inductor and the other one for probably rectification. Okay, uh, this board got pulled out from a flat screen TV and uh, it's a switch mode power supply board. And it has uh, one MOSFET that you can use. So you would need to find another matching MOSFET or you can simply buy MOSFETs. So first little quick explanation on how this power supply actually works and what makes a switch mode power supply a switch mode power supply. So the basic operation of a switch mode power supply is that power comes in here, uh, it comes through uh, these guys right here, and I want to point out something. So as you can see uh, right here, uh, it says uh, FLP which stands for uh, filtering inductor and uh, these are designed to eat up high frequency spikes so if you want to use an inductor these are not the kind I'd recommend uh, because they are designed to basically eat power instead of switch power it has to do with what materials they're made out of so uh, once it gets past uh, all of these components uh, the AC is then rectified through these four diodes here and uh, it charges up the capacitor here. So we actually see where those traces go. Uh, so from the diodes, right to this capacitor here. And then we can see that uh, it's connected to this transformer. And uh, then it follows around to the other side of the circuit here, uh, which is the bottom of that heatsink. If you look on the bottom of that heatsink, so right in that area, uh, you'll see that there is a MOSFET underneath there and uh, the MOSFET drain is connected to the transformer and uh, the source is connected to the capacitor essentially so when the power supply needs power it will just send a pulse to the transformer and uh, every time it needs more power it will just send another pulse and that pulse it just gets sent to uh, these diodes right here which are the rectifying diodes and basically then to these smaller smoothing capacitors which gives you the stable lower output voltage to run things so uh, as I said here would be a MOSFET and uh, here we have really big diodes as uh, are really big got Scotty diodes Scotty Scott key scotch key people call them different things it's like piezo PZAO PZO PZAO PAZAO um, anyway uh, uh, and then we got some little inductors here so that's labeled with an L, uh, those are labeled with L's, uh, that's labeled with an L as well. So those are absolutely suitable inductors that you could use. Uh, here we have a bipolar capacitor. This is just basically a film capacitor. And we have two more film capacitors up here as well that you can take. So right here is a film capacitor and right here is a film capacitor. capacitor. Um, so yeah, there are definitely parts that you can look for as well. All these boards contain a lot of parts, and uh, if you take some time to observe, you can uh, figure them out. Just a couple of also other things to note, just so you can understand what's going on uh, with some of the other parts too. First of all, the easiest explanation, uh, resistors. I'm just going to show you the top of this chart on my box. So that pretty much explains how to read those types of resistors. These are surface mount resistors. 
I would not recommend using them for the high voltage ZVS drivers simply because they're not rated for the wattage. But I'm going to show you how to read these. So you'll see that that guy right there in the middle it says 102 and underneath it, it says 1K. Well, so you would do the mathematics as being 10 and uh, that 2 tells you how many multipliers of 10 you'd have. So that's 10 times 10 times 10 or 10 times 100 which gives you a thousand. Uh, here we can look through. There's the 512 resistor. Next to it you can see it says 5K. So that would be 51 times 100 or two multiples of 10 giving you the 5.1K or 5100. Uh, you can see the 10K is gone but as you would imagine that would be 10 with a multiplier of three tens, so that would be the one, or that would be ten with the multiplier of ten times ten times ten, giving you ten thousand. So pretty easy to read on those guys as well. Resistors also come in much bigger forms too. For extremely large ZVS circuits, uh, so for ones that are exceeding like a hundred volts. I'd recommend using a very large resistor. That's a hundred ohms, so it's uh, actually a really, really, really low resistance for what you'd use. It's just use something like a, a 3K, 4K, uh, if not more up at those ranges. And uh, these, as I said, are, co are coated in ceramic. So these are power handling resistors. Uh, and they are something that is probably best left not touched when running. Uh, they're this big mostly to dissipate the heat. So it has the exact same resistance as a smaller resistor except it can handle a lot more power which is important for bigger ZVS setups and uh, I mean much bigger. So also keep that in mind uh, to also consider that if you're really designing for a very large power system and they come in different sizes too so here's one and uh, here's another little guy time for the conclusion after nearly three hours of this video going on uh, we're gonna cover the MOSFETs then so when you're looking for a MOSFET data sheet you see here uh, there's a couple of numbers on that MOSFET uh, so for example you're gonna be looking for the top row of numbers so uh, in this case actually we're gonna ignore the N and the TB and uh, you'd be looking for the 18N06L. For other MOSFETs, such as these, you see that top letter, that P75NS75. And uh, even on the SMT components, you'll also see a bunch of numbers that you can kind of see on uh, this component. You'll see the numbers here. So, for looking uh, up that MOSFET, you would just look up the 7392. It's pretty simple. There's a couple of things on a MOSFET data sheet to look at. First thing is the voltage and current, or amperage. Uh, those things are to be most important. You've got a couple of other things on the MOSFET data sheet as well, such as the on resistance, the on state resistance. Uh, the higher the on state resistance, the more the MOSFETs will generate heat as they're operating. And then you're going to look for gate capacitance, uh, which basically just means that the gate requires more voltage slash current to fully reach the on state. So lower gate capacitance means usually faster switching speeds and higher efficiency, uh, where the bigger MOSFETs usually have a higher on resistance and a higher gate capacitance. They can handle more power, but usually are less efficient. A couple of things to note here. Uh, we saw with the inductor spike that it is just in general a good idea to always protect your MOSFET gates with the Zener diode. Once again, it's very simple to apply. You just have to put the cathode on the gate and the anode on the source, and that'll make sure that there are no spikes. Uh, with resistors, it is important to note uh, I have about 1k of resistance on here, so two. Uh, 2.5 K's in parallel together. You can see that. Uh, and that is because I was running this at a much higher voltage or higher voltage. I was running this at uh, the 16 volt range. 
which you want to have higher wattage and uh, higher resistance resistors on just because of the amount of power that you're going to be moving between your diodes and uh, your on resistors so of course the more power you put in to your system more voltage you put into your system uh, the more voltage is going to come off the drain and go through the diode and fight against your on resistors uh, of course the more it fights with a higher voltage the more current it's going to uh, not current the more heat it's going to generate uh, as that goes up uh, you'll see that there's a little switch right here uh, this switch is actually just connecting the positive to the two legs of the two resistors so essentially uh, that switch is uh, between this wire and the two resistors so when I flip the switch on it connects that circuit and sends the on signal to each MOSFET to turn on uh, this is a good setup to use for turning on your CVS uh, it's bad however because it actually offers uh, no protection if there's a catastrophic failure uh, you'll just sit there and uh, pretty much cook everything so that is one way of turning on and controlling your ZVS it's uh, also stated to make sure that you have a smooth power supply and uh, if you have that on at full voltage just to make sure that you start oscillation in your circuit immediately and have no problems with that uh, the resistors are pretty much, uh, you know, pretty much a uh, minor thing. And then we have the magnetics side to it. So this is uh, essentially the resident capacitor, which as you've seen in the video, has a lot to do with the tuning of the transformer. And uh, the inductor here, which is for current limiting mostly. Uh, so between the transformer and uh, this capacitor, it's basically your LC network and... Uh, and this inductor here uh, just helps regulate everything plays a part in it as well if you have any questions uh, which I hope if you watch the whole video you have absolutely none of because I tried to be as thorough as I could possibly be to drop them down in the comments I'd be curious to see what questions you could possibly have uh, they'd probably be very interesting questions or at least I hope so uh, the next bare and basic video I'd like to do is actually on building a DVD burner laser pointer and uh, over here I've already got started on some of that stuff so there's a whole bunch of uh, different configurations of laser diodes already pulled from DVD burners as well as I've got a microscope set up for really 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 small images so we can take a look and see what the wiring is on the super multi diodes as well so stay tuned for that it's gonna be another long progress project uh, another long project and uh, that's gonna be really exciting we're gonna show you how to turn literally any uh, DVD burner laser diode any form factor into a burning laser pointer uh, that should be fun